So welcome everybody. Um, obviously, if you've been in the sessions today, you've heard you know about the value of CPQ and and what kind of returns you're getting. Uh, what we're going to learn today, though, is how can you amplify that ROI in CPQ? You know, by integrating and having an integrated CLM system right with your CPQ has provided tremendous returns. And we're happy to have Michelle here from Rogers walk through really their results as they've really went and embarked on an integration of CPQ with CLM at Rogers. Michelle? Thanks, Doc. Good afternoon, everybody. I had a joke ready about my picture. Um, I was going to say that that was me before we deployed a CPQ CLM system, and this is me now, but I thought maybe the Optus folks wouldn't find that quite as amusing as I do. So let's just say that that's me before parenthood, and this is me now, which is equally true. So I am the director of deal and contract management at Rogers, which means that I'm responsible for everything uh, on the deal to contract lifecycle chain as far as incorporating all of our approvals into an accurate contract, delivering that contract to our customers, the systems that deliver that contract to our customers, um, and post-contract lifecycle management, making sure that we adhere to those contracts, and also revenue assurance as well that relates to contracts. Um, I normally skip over this slide for a Canadian audience, but for the purposes of uh, non-Canadians, Rogers is an integrated communications company based out of Canada, obviously, based out of Toronto, Ontario. Um, we are what's normally referred to as a quad play in the industry, which is to say that we are both an IP, cable, voice, um, and uh, digital company. And uh, we are Canada's largest wireless communications carrier, as, large as, as well as one of our lar its largest cable TV carriers. We also own the uh, several sports franchises, such as the um, half of the Toronto Maple Leafs, all of the Toronto Blue Jays, a lot of uh, magazine and uh, TV and radio um, in Canada. So again, quite a large company. Our um, annualized revenues last year were somewhere in the order of about $13.7 billion. I work for the portion of Rogers known as the Enterprise Business Unit, so the portion of Rogers that is the B2B space, um, which represents about 2.5 of that $13.7 billion in annualized revenue. So still quite a big slice of the pie, but in the grand scheme of the overall Rogers, we are sort of the, uh, the smaller cousin to our, our consumer business unit. So how did we get here and why am I here talking to you about, um, about CPQ and CLM transformation today? The enterprise business unit at Rogers is actually um, a amalgamation of a bunch of acquired companies. And I'm sure this is actually fairly consistent across a lot of industries, but Rogers is a company that was founded around a monopoly, but then uh, expanded through acquisition. And so when we did that acquisition, uh, we realized that we had not one, not two, but three separate Salesforce uh, CRMs. Different companies that we had acquired had, uh, sale, had purchased Salesforce independently. And when we were merged into a single business unit, we found that those instances were now not only um, duplicative, but also conflicting with one another. So the first part of our, of our growth stage into a CPQ CLM quote to cash enterprise was to unify those three instances into a single, into a single Salesforce instance, which was done in 2015. That was right around the time that I was taking over my current role. So this was happening as I was hired to, uh, to transform into the next stage. At the same time as we were doing that, we also went to RFP for a CPQ CLM system. So in 20, late 2013, early 2014, we went to RFP and looked for both an integrator and a CPQ CLM software um, as a service provider. And in early 2015, we chose Aptus as our, as our CPQ and CLM provider. Um, you'll see May 2016 there, that is actually the date that our product, which we refer to internally as Optic, um, went live. So our CPQ CLM system was um, in its infancy in 2014, 2015. Uh, the project to deploy it took place over about an 11 month time span and we went live on May 15th of 2016. So coming up on one year that we've been on our, our new Aptus CPQ CLM system. So that's a little bit about our evolution as far as software um, is concerned within Rogers. So a little bit about why we chose Aptus. Um, Aptus um, ticked a lot of the boxes that we had for our RFP review process. For example, we were looking for a Salesforce native uh, application because Salesforce was, as I just demonstrated, one of our was our, our existing CRM. So we weren't interested in doing any funky internal configurations to, to marry back to our CRM data. We knew that that information was already there. We'd already placed a lot of investment dollars into making sure that it was consolidated and accurate. And so we wanted to build upon that investment. So that was definitely one of our key, key business drivers. 
Another was that we were looking for a product that was strong in both CPQ and CLM. There wasn't really one side of the, the, of the fence, if you will, that we were more interested in. Um, I come from a legal background, so my personal vested interest was very much on the CLM side, but we obviously had a lot of people in our finance and our revenue assurance and our deal desk area who were very interested in making sure that we had a strong CPQ situation. Um, and at no point did one of those kind of play a, a stronger role than the other. So again, we were looking for something that was very strong on both sides of the fence. And a lot of the, um, a lot of the providers that we reviewed at that time were heavily weighted in strengths on one side or the other. So they were a very strong CLM provider with a weak CPQ, or they were a very strong CP CPQ provider with a weak CLM, or alternatively, they were proposing that we went to, a third, to another party entirely for the opposite, right? That we would take their CPQ system and then go, go to tender again for, for a CLM, which we weren't interested in at all. We were really looking at for something that was consolidated and holistic. So again, that was one of the big drivers for, for, for us to, to choose Aptus. Um, it being mobile capable was a really big deal for us. Um, our sales force, as, as everybody else's is, are on the road 24-7, so they don't need to be logging back into a laptop in order, to, um, in order to perceive their deals, so we needed something that was Salesforce 1 compatible. And we also knew that we ran a very unique, for want of a better term, um, internal business process. We had, um, as it turns out, about 8,600 SKUs that we needed to load into our product catalog they each have about 190 attributes. So each SKU has a, about 190 data points that we needed to decide on and configure in order for us to be able to, to drive the system to, uh, to treat that SKU accurately. And that went from everywhere from which segment and which channel was permitted to sell that SKU, all the way down to which billing platform did it bill off of, uh, you know, was, was uh, annual revenue permitted, all kinds of different attributes that each of those SKUs needed to be, needed to be configured against. So again, and also that's a, a very evolving product catalog. We're launching new products on a monthly basis. We're retiring old products. We're changing existing attributes. We're deciding to move a product up market or down market. So we knew that we needed to be working with a system that allowed us to be very maneuverable and flexible because we just couldn't wait out the cycle times. To, to have to, um, to update that data in a more sort of old-fashioned, prem-based type manner. So again, some of our, our core business drivers for why we chose the Aptus product. As far as internally, what we needed to do to sell this system to our, um, to our business folks and our finance folks to justify the revenue, um, these are what I would consider the more tangible business case drivers. Um, I'll speak a little bit later about the intangibles as well, because I would say that those came out almost as, as important, if not more important, than some of these key business case drivers on the tangible side. But obviously, from a financial business case point of view, you need to be able to point to realizable um, gains or, or less loss. Um, and so these were the, um, some of the four key keystones that we, that we pointed to. Cycle time reduction, so it's fairly straightforward. I'll describe our pre-existing system, but once you see it, you'll understand why an, an integrated CPQ CLM system results in cycle time reduction. Um, so we were very much looking at getting revenue in faster. We, um, we measure ourselves on service order intervals on a lot of our products. So from the point of sales inception to the day that that, rev that product bills, and in the telecommunications space, that can actually be quite a long interval, right? So if you're rolling a truck, you're, you're building a circuit, you're, uh, you're um, ordering third-party hardware, you're configuring to a customer's needs, there can be 70 or 80 days from point of contract signature all the way out to, uh, to revenue recognition. Any gains in that 70 to 80 day period is money in the bank for us. So any kind of, uh, any kind of improvements in that was going to be a, bit, a, big, a big driver. Revenue assurance, which is something very near and dear to my heart, because I mentioned uh, it does fall within my responsibility. Our old systems were very swivel chair, uh, very manual, and very um, uh, human error uh, prone, let's say. Um, so anything that was going to close some of those revenue ga gaps, where we were not going to be getting swivel chair errors, human errors into data entry, um, questions of when deal desk said this, did they really mean it to be configured this way or did, you know, was that intended to be something else? A lot of that back and forth that would happen between my team and our deal desk team about approvals and what was truly meant within them um, was meant to go away with this product or at least become simpler so that we could look to a single source of truth as far as approved fi financials were concerned. Cost avoidance, so some of our legacy systems were, as I mentioned, on-prem based, so we were still paying to host them, we're still paying for licensing fees, and any time we wanted to update them, we were still paying for change requests um, to the tune of you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, just to make 
update requests that were sort of what I would consider business as usual. You needed to upgrade your contract collateral. You needed to launch a new product. You were changing your you were changing your rack rate for a for a, for a product. All of that in our old systems cost real dollars. We were actually writing a check to somebody to make those types of those types of changes. So cost avoidance again was a fairly straightforward business case for uh, for us to be able to make. And finally, a reallocation of full time. So again, I mentioned swivel chairing. Um, so we had people whose jobs were literally to take data off of our, let's call it CPQ for the sake of argument system, and turn around and enter it into, again, let's call it CLM for the sake of argument system. Um, and all of those people, when our system came, in, came, uh, came about, could be redeployed. Thankfully, none of them actually lost their jobs. They were redeployed into other operational jobs where they actually were driving value. So when all that was said and done, um, the total cost of ownership and the payback for our project was 15 months, which I gather, um, based on the look of people in our, in our approvals process, was an exceptionally short period of time to get payback. So on the left of the slide, um, a very simplified version of what our, again, in quotes, CPQ, CLM systems looked like pre-Optic, pre pre-Aptis. So we inherited a series of different projects, uh, sorry, different systems and different processes from each of our um, inherited business units, each of which was completely disparate from one another. Of course, they grew up in a completely different ascent part of the enterprise, and in some cases, what was then a third party standalone business, none of which were consistent in, in process, in approvals, in governance, in output, in look, in feel, in touch, everything that you could possibly imagine was different between those four systems. So that was what we were living with up until May 15, 2016. Um, with, I, I, I say somewhat tongue in cheek, with the push of a button, with the deployment of our Aptis system uh, on May 15th, we ended up in a fully integrated CPQ CLM system, um, one unified opportunity, one unified quote, one unified contract. So in our old state system, if a customer came to Rogers and bought a data center product, for example, we would have run them through the data center set of that food chain and out would have come a data center agreement. That customer would then come back from a, to us six months later and say, we really liked your data center, now I'd like to buy some circuits from you. And then we would put them into the wireline legacy part of our old, old state uh, process and out would come a wireline agreement. And the customer would come to us and say, but I already have an agreement with you. It even says right there at the top, master master services agreement. Why are you making me sign another? We said, no, no, that's your master data center services agreement. And those are your master data center prices. Now you have to sign a different agreement with us because essentially, even though you see us as Rogers, we see us as these four separate business units. So again, a very poor customer experience. And internally, as a salesperson, if you were onboarding a salesperson into this environment, imagine what their training would be like, right? Imagine you know, starting your first day and saying, you're supposed to sell everything, but oh, by the way, <laughs> Here are the eight licenses and the you know, 16 days of video, of video uh, training that you need to watch just to be able to quote across any of those four business units. So internally, a mess. Um, and of course, not reportable, right? No, no, nothing that tied any one of those systems to the other. So if someone came to me and said, how many agreements do we have with customer X? I would literally have to go into each of those systems and query information. When are each of those agreements due? Again, go into each of those systems and query information. There was nothing to com composite all of that information together to give us a view of our customer as a whole. So again, new state gives us that view. What I will mention is that we did not migrate our legacy data into our new system for a number of business reasons that I can go into with a little bit of time. Um, but the short answer was there was, it, there was too much potential for error. Because those old legacy systems again, were, were, were conceived of and, and were built up completely one, separate from one, one another. There was too much potential to mismatch customer data, um, too much potential to um, potentially confuse offers, SKUs, no way to pull in approvals from um, you know, what was effect, effectively an email approval system in, in some of our legacies. So our optic system sees the world as though May 15th was the dawning of time which is of course a limitation, right? We don't have that ability to look backwards into what happened before May 15th. So we got, May 15th we deployed and we said, you know, we're gonna transition. We gave our salespeople 60 days to move, close out their opportunities in their old systems, right? So you have something in flight, it's in the old system, you have 60 days to finish your job, get the customer to sign. If not, 
you have to start it fresh in the new system. And again, on day one, Aptus was fresh and new and there was nothing, there was no data in there. Now that we've lived in the system for a year, and we're now sort of, you know, we've got our legs underneath us, we understand how it works, we know where, where to go for things. We've now, uh, I actually now have a project starting next Monday when I'm back in Canada, to have, a, have people actually migrate that data back into, backwards into our Optus system now. So that now we're gonna be able to look backwards. But I wasn't confident enough to say that that would have been an accurate exercise in the, in the midst of everything else that was happening during deployment to do that day one. So we lived in this sort of this two-legged world for a year. And it, again, it wasn't ideal, but it was certainly a heck of a lot better than what we had before. Um, and now that we're, again, stable and comfortable and know our system inside and out, now I feel comfortable saying, good. Now we can pull that data backwards so that our Aptus system will become truly our one source of truth and everything we know about our customer will be in that system. So I talked a little bit about um, how this allowed us to consolidate the, the experience. So again, both from a sales rep point of view and from a customer point of view, this is what our new stage, staging, sales stage looks like. At the opportunity level in Salesforce, you no longer have to do a standalone opportunity for each um, former line of business. We consolidated our, our opportunity profile such that now it captures all of the data that would be consistent across those four, those four legacy lines of business. At the quoting stage, we're now able to run a quote for multiple lines of business at once, which we couldn't do before, which an interesting aside about that, what, what that limited us to do is if we were selling something bundled, right? If we were, if we were selling a customer things that, that straddled over our legacy uh, lines of business, um, the people who were doing the approvals for that had no visibility to what was going on on the other side of the fence other than somebody telling you. So if somebody was, was looking at the, the margins on a data center deal and had no visibility to what we were selling that customer at the same time on a wireless deal, they would not have the ability to say, as a whole, this deal is worth X to us and therefore we're going to discount it by, by a certain amount. So we literally had to sort of push and pull at levers very awkwardly to make sure that that was happening internally, whereas now it just, it's a natural part of the system. If you put in a data center opportunity at the same time as you put in a wireless opportunity, they go to the same person who does the same approval flows, who has visibility to the entire deal, and they can discount accordingly. So it gives us that, that ability to have, again, a much more holistic view of our customer. In the approval flows, again, logically, you would think that that would have been consistent um, pr previously, but it wasn't. Different teams were getting involved. Um, different teams, um, there was a lot of uh, email exchanges between those teams. You know, I'm approving such and such a deal. Have you already done the approvals on the technical side? Like a, a very a, a stark lack of visibility into what was going on in the approval uh, in the approval stage. Now our approval flows are unified, right? So every opportunity goes through the same flow. There are some exceptions. Some some deals don't have to go to a technical review, for example, and others do. That deal is held until technical review is complete. So we contemplated whether we were going to do serialized or parallel approvals. We ended up doing serial, serialized. And the logic for that was that we didn't want to burden a team further down the flow with reviewing a deal that was going to get stopped by a team earlier in the flow. Right? So by way of example, um, a wireline deal that needed a technical architect to approve being pushed through in tandem with a wireless deal that didn't that wireless deal would bypass the technical architect and would go straight to the deal desk, and the deal desk would do their work on the pricing. Meanwhile, if the technical architect is, is rejecting the technical configuration of that deal, that deal desk wasted that time, right? They just spent time approving a deal that is never going to go anywhere because it's not technically sound. So we did decide at the end of the day to do serialized approvals. There's obviously an argument for parallel as well. Um, it does, when things go well, it goes through the system faster. When things don't go well, when something gets shunted back, then effectively you're abandoning a lot of work. And because we tend to abandon a lot of work anyway, right? Our customers change their minds. We put something in front of them. They, they see the price. They, they back away. They, they change their scope. Um, because we knew that was a part, a natural part of our sales cycle, we really um, decided to, uh, that serial was the way to go for us. Um, and then finally, again, near, near to my heart, a contract. So in our previous life, as I mentioned, there was no such thing as an overarching agreement for all of our services. Um, but this is the structure that we now, we've now gone with. So it allows us to contract once with our customers, never again at the 
at the highest level, right? So once they have a master agreement with us, it is truly a master agreement. They never have to sign that again. And everything else goes through as either a, an addendum or just a simply a pricing quote. Um, and I can't emphasize enough how much that has simplified my team in particular, our lives. Um, and also from a customer experience point of view, how much simpler it is from the customer to understand why it is that they don't have to sign multiple agreements with the same provider. A little bit about metrics. So I mentioned that in our previous world, we were highly, a lot of our systems were not reportal. One of the ones that was, because it was Salesforce based, was our wireline quoting, quoting and uh, contracting system. So it was really the only um, like for like comparison that we could do as far as cycle uh, uh, turnaround time and, and cycle intervals are concerned. So these are our actual metrics measured as of about five or six months after launch. So you'll see that in um, our previous uh, legacy systems, the average turnaround time for a wireline deal was 52 business hours. All right, so from the time an opportunity was created until when that agreement was signed with a customer, we averaged about 52 business hours, which actually doesn't sound all that bad in the grand scheme of things, but um, apparently it could be approved, improved upon because when we launched, six months after launching um, our app to converge CPQ CLM system, the average time went down to 18.5. So 64% redu 64 reduction in cycle time as far as our wireline agreements are concerned. But probably even more important, although not necessarily as sexy to report on, was the standard deviation. So you can see that our standard deviation in our legacy systems was 233. After, we went down to 29.5. And what that tells me is that a salesperson in our legacy system might have gotten that deal in two and a half hours or they might have gotten that deal approved in 170 hours. And if there's one thing I know about salespeople is that they like to be able to deliver on their commitments to their customers. So when a salesperson had a good experience, they had a good day, everybody's cues were clean and their deal went straight through, right? That's fantastic. I just got this deal approved in two and a half hours. Similar deal comes up the next week and they promise the customer, I'll have that contract in your hands tomorrow because last week I had this really great experience and things went really smoothly. Well, with the standard deviation that we were experiencing, not entirely likely, right? That, that the extremes of experience were very high. Again, because we were in a very manual system, people were relying on emails, um, you know, approvers were going away on vacation and not being able to delegate their approval authorities, whatever it was that was making those extremes so wide, disappeared or, or greatly reduced when we went into a merged CPQ CLM system, um, which brings a lot of joy to our salespeople because it means that they can actually deliver on what they say, right? So if it, if it was three and a half hours last week, then it's likely to be three and a half to four and a half this week and that they can keep true to their customer promises and they can actually, to move on to the next uh, point, be a lot more accurate about their forecasting. So our sales force is very highly measured on forecast accuracy, right? So we monitor our funnel um, uh, virtuously. Um, and that's because we're in a very high volume um, industry where having money back from our customers is exceptionally important. Um, and so we need to know when we're gonna have deals closed. So in our pre-Aptis uh, pre um, system, our forecasts were based off of our or CRM. So a salesperson would open up an opportunity, would load in a number as to what the TCV of that opportunity was and maybe even the monthly recurring charge and would call out a date. I think the customer is going to sign this by July 1st. And that became the source of truth because that was all we knew, right? From a system basis, that was all that we knew about that opportunity until the day that that revenue booked. So imagine our surprise if the deal that got called out as a $150,000 deal, $150, deal reduced to a $25,000 deal. And imagine the sales leader's surprise when the forecast that that $150,000 deal was built on suddenly moved into the, fall, into the following month. It slipped from July to August. So all of those issues um, resolved to a great extent because in our CPQ CLM system, all of that forecasting accuracy is driven by the quote, right? So salespeople make a preliminary estimate at the opportunity stage, but as soon as we've quoted something, that preliminary, es preliminary estimate is overwritten by what Aptis tells us is true. Right? So we now know that, that that information is accurate and it continues to get overwritten every single time that quote gets updated until the day that that quote gets finalized as an agreement. And then likewise, as far as sales, sales stages are concerned, um, 
the triggers as, our, as a deal moves through our system are what trigger our sales stages, right? So you can't be a 90% commit if you haven't generated an agreement yet. Because clearly your customer is not ready to commit if they haven't seen the paperwork, right? So likewise, you can be in the identify stage, but if you've provided an agreement to your customer, you're clearly further along than identification in, implies, right? So all of that is now driven by, again, moving things through the system, and it results in a much more consistent funnel. Because what we would see previously is we would see at month end, the last week of the month, surprisingly, our funnel would bubble, right? All of a sudden, everybody was at 90% commit. And then the first day of the month would come, would come and that funnel would collapse because the deals that didn't close suddenly weren't 90% commit anymore. They were 75. Um, the other thing that we saw um, was that, so our um, agreement closure is tied to our DocuSign. So we're fully integrated to DocuSign from the point of view of e-signature. Um, and when a customer e-signs DocuSign, that's what closes our agreement in our system. So there is no falseness to when we close a deal. What would happen previously is a salesperson would get a, a hand-signed uh, hand agreement and it would be, let's say, the 25th of the month and they'd already made their quota that month and the escalators weren't that great. So they would sit on that agreement for five days and they would submit it on the first of the month because they were better off from a commission point of view to submit it in the following month. Which from a salesperson's point of view, I understand completely, but from Roger's point of view, that was five days that we didn't have that money. So there's no longer an ability for salespeople to do that, which quite frankly, they're not always all that thrilled about, but it is, it is tied directly to when that customer signs their agreement. I've only got a few minutes left, but really quickly um, to talk about some of the things that we noticed when we were rolling out our CPQ CLM system. So some of the things that we wish we knew had I been here, I actually was here last year. Uh, we were about a month before implementation. So had somebody been able to tell me these things, I probably a little bit too late, a month before implementation, but these were things that I really wish I had known. And had I, were I to go back and do it over again, these are things that I would definitely tell myself. So don't underestimate how much upfront business case and planning you need to do. It's kind of a, a bit of a motherhood statement. Um, we did something in the order of 20,000 hours of requirements gathering, and it still wasn't enough. Right? It still missed every single corner case that you could possibly imagine. Right? And that's just the nature of people. Right? Tell me how you sell something, and they'll tell you how you, they sell something 80% of the time. And they'll forget about that minutia. They'll forget about that exception. They'll forget about that behind the, behind the table process that they work that one time because you know, things are kind of fiddly in the systems. So had we had more time, I would have allowed people to come back multiple times to give their requirements because as they lived through you know, their life, things would have occurred to them, right? I forgot to mention that one situation. I forgot, oh, it just occurred to me that this deal might come up again and it's unique. Um, sticking to your guns on implementation timelines. So we, we ran a pretty short implementation timeline at 11, uh, 11 months. Um, there was pressure at the end to back off from that and to delay, and to delay delivery. We did not um, for a number of reasons. One was because we had a several projects stacked up behind our project that were waiting on our project to launch in order to be able to, to deliver their deliverables. Um, but also because we knew that it was never gonna be perfect day one, right? There was always gonna be something that was gonna need to come out of, of the, the living of, of that system and deferring that wasn't gonna make anything any better, right? So it was very much just sort of a, a you know, grit your teeth, stick to your guns, get it done, live with the, you know, the cacophony as that, as that, um, as that hit, and then let the real issues sift out and then, and then triage and identify them. Um, blowing up your current state process entirely, right? So we, when we had people in for requirements, we were very explicit with them. Don't tell me about what is wrong with our current systems and how you work around them. Tell me about how it should be if it was perfect, right? So there's a lot of how you work. It's very much dealt around how you're already handcuffed by your existing processes and systems. And so people would describe to us, well, I do it this way because that gets us past this particular hurdle or there's a unique issue. No, I don't want to hear about how you do it today. I want to hear about how it would be perfect, right? Tell me what it would look like if there were no hurdles and then try and build your, your solution around that to the extent that you can. Um, change management, I think, was um, amply mentioned in the previous session. And again, it sort of goes to the business case and, effort, uh, and, and, um, um, and planning. Um, a huge amount of change management and training is required, especially because you are blowing up existing business processes, right? So you're not just changing the button pushing. People learn button pushing very quickly, right? It's an intuitive thing. We're all very IT adept. 
being able to, to find the right button, button to push something forward isn't the hurdle. The hurdle is understanding why you have to push that button and knowing what pushing that button does. So all of the stuff that's going on behind that system is what it's really, really important to, to train people on because that's what, what tended to, to stir up the most chatter. Um, I mentioned our legacy data uh, migration issues and how we decided to hold off on that and I think that was a wise choice. And we also realized very early on that we were not going to be able to do this all ourselves. So although we do have a lot of Aptus certified developers on staff, um, we decided to go with Deloitte as our integrator and that was a huge boon because we could obviously rely on their expertise having done this for other, for other vendors. So that is all that I have. Oh my goodness, I'm exactly on time. That is all I have to say. If anybody has any questions for me, I'll make sure I'm available in the, in the room nearby and uh, feel free to come up and ask. Thank you.